With a starting price of US$2,000 a piece, Apple's new MacBook Pros aren't just expensive, but rumoured to be more anti-repair than previous generations. Kitted out, one of these laptops sells new from Apple for US$6,500. That's $9,800 for us Aussies. When you're spending that kind of money on a new laptop, you want to make sure you actually own the thing. Apple's own processors might allow for performance optimization, but it also allows for the potential of controlling your hardware. I have two MacBook Pros here to test their repairability, courtesy of Hoxton Max. If you're looking for a refurbished device, give Hoxton Max a look, offering one-year warranty, free UK delivery, and a range of Mac laptops, desktops, and iPads in various conditions to suit your budget. Learn more at hoxtonmax.co.uk. Like Apple's iPhone, opening the MacBook Pro requires a specialty pentalobe driver to defeat Apple's security screws. Once all the screws are removed, there are several clips holding the base onto the top case. Using a plastic pick can help free them. Inside, we see the beautifully dark insides of the MacBook Pro. I'm not surprised to see the SSD NAND flash soldered in place, as Apple's been doing this for several years now. The only computers they sell with removable NAND is the Mac Studio and Mac Pro. Also visible is the glued-in 70 watt hour battery. Before proceeding any further, I'll open the other MacBook Pro. It's an identical machine that we'll use to swap parts with, allowing us to see if Apple rejects replacement parts on their laptops like they do on their phones. Despite being the same model, both with one terabyte of storage, one laptop has extra NAND chips. But other than that, these two are identical machines. Apple is still using thin flex cables to drive their LCD display. I can already see where to these ones. They have offered free repair to some but not all affected MacBook Pro models, where these cables have caused display issues after wearing out. I can only hope the newer models have improved resilience to this wear. Even so, sometimes accidents happen and you'll need to replace the display. This is what we'll be testing first, that is after I disconnect the battery. I have labelled each computer's display, top case and logic board so that we can keep track of everything. To detach the display, I'll need to first remove the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth antenna from the rear vent. Totaling 18 screws comprising of Torx and Apple's own Pentalobe security screws. Once removed, we can now start on detaching the display's flex cables, which are housed under metal brackets. There is a third cable to the side of one of the hinges that is responsible for reporting the angle of the display. As we're about to find out, this cable is more important than you might first think. Under two decorative covers are the main hinge screws. To allow us to remove the display, we must hang it over the edge of a table. This will allow the screen to clear the top case. Working it free, ensuring not to damage any fragile cables in the process. It took a total of 45 screws to remove the display. In comparison, the framework laptop I looked at recently required only 9 to remove the bare LCD panel. But enough talking, it's time for another 45 screws so I can get the screen off the other MacBook Pro. This will allow us to swap the LCD panels to try and replicate some of the rumoured issues that are facing display replacements on these MacBook Pro models. With the display loosely attached, I can connect the battery for a test. Apparently, display replacements kill the laptop's ability to enter sleep when the new screen is closed. At first, this laptop didn't even want to turn on, but like iPhones, it just needed the charger connected after disconnecting the battery. So with laptop A's screen on laptop B, you would expect everything to work right. After all, these are two brand new Apple laptops. But after logging in, I noticed an anomaly on the display. And I'm not talking about that big notch, but the weird brighter and darker spots towards the top of the display. But everything else still appears to be working, including the display's inbuilt camera and the sleep functionality when the lid is closed, evident by the pausing of video playback when closed. It still feels like portables are a thing that... 
just came out. This Motorola Razr's folding display has a purple line. Auto brightness still works, although appears to be jittery. There's also a dead spot around halfway, with a large jump in brightness when shifting the levels up or down. Changing the color profiles has no effect other than making some of the deformities more obvious. And the option for True Tone has vanished from settings, just like it does on iPhones with a replaced display. Not even updating the software resolved the issue. At this point, I'm sure some are certain I've damaged the display, and to a repair shop or DIY repairer, you may reach the same conclusion if you did this yourself. But what we have is another MacBook Pro. If the behavior is the same on another laptop, we can confirm it's not a result of my workmanship. This is why I purchased two of the same device. So it's time for display B to be attached onto laptop A. And would you look at that? Not only do we have issues with the display, but they are identical to the other MacBook Pros, even the size and position of the marks. So what's causing it? Taking an educated guess, I'd say each display and its calibration data is paired to each MacBook. When the display changes, the mini LED backlight displays this pattern. Both laptops exhibit identical issues, from the marks on the screen, glitchy brightness, and no true tone. The question is, will they work properly when I switch them back? Well, there's only one way to find out. With laptop A's screen back on laptop A, the marks and glitches are gone, and it works as intended. But what about that rumored sleep issue? Well, we're not out of the clear yet. Remember that little cable I said was of importance? This is it. The lid angle sensor. Basically, every laptop for the last 20 years has used a magnetic hall effect sensor to detect if the display is closed. A magnet in proximity to the sensor, and the screen shuts off. Simple and effective. But it appears Apple has decided to think different. I assume their approach is similar, but works on the magnetic field's direction, not distance. We'll swap this little sensor and see what happens. We get a chime, but no display. The trackpad won't click, and the keyboard doesn't wake the laptop. Not until I press the power button that we see the lock screen, but still the keyboard and trackpad don't work. Have we just crippled a several thousand dollar laptop by replacing one small cable? I reopen the display again to find everything working. Just a glitch, right? Well, not quite. Moving the display, we find it shuts off at about 90 degrees, and everything becomes unresponsive. But move it out of that position and everything lights up again. We can better understand this with playback of video. Which will modify to create the privacy screen. This should work on any The video continues when the display is closed, meaning the laptop isn't going to sleep. It's not until we open it back up to 90 degrees when it shuts off and goes to sleep. Specifically as I wanted the small version of the iPad. When we go past this range, it switches back on again. Versions newer than the Mini 3 have their glass. Both laptops now fail to sleep. Doctors call this insomnia. I wonder what the genius bar calls it. One difference between the two is one won't sleep no matter the angle. One odd thing I picked up on is that both machines deleted my fingerprint after doing this swap. This didn't occur with the display, only when I've changed the angle sensor by itself. Apple's self-service repair store will currently sell you the part to select countries, but it requires their approval and remote connection to your computer to complete the calibration. If you don't buy the part from them, they won't calibrate it. Either way, the only repair option is still through Apple. What happens when the laptop is no longer supported, or well, they stop selling the part? Is your laptop that could have cost you six and a half thousand US dollars rendered useless over a piece of calibration you can't access because they won't give it to you? This calibration should be preloaded on the computer. You should not have to pay extra money to gain access to it. So I'm not sure if it's just luck or different models of screen. With the sensor swapped back, it now functions just like it did before, correctly. 
I'll get both displays reattached properly before we test what happens when we swap the logic boards. But from what we've seen so far, it appears the display is paired to each MacBook's logic board, and the lid angle sensor is paired to each display. Meaning if you have the original angle sensor for the display, it'll work correctly on another MacBook, just the display's image won't. And if you have an original screen, but a new lid angle sensor, the display's image will work fine, but the computer won't sleep. Either way, it means you can't replace the display or the lid angle sensor. With the RAM, SSD and CPU soldered on, there isn't much else to replace other than the battery or ports. I'm surprised to see almost every port has its own cable, meaning you can replace each port independently. This does, however, add to the number of screws we need to remove to get the logic board out of the top case. The only ports directly soldered to the logic board are the SD card reader and HDMI port. Up in this corner is the flex cable for the Touch ID sensor. It looks like they've almost just reused an iPhone fingerprint sensor as the cable is just as small and fragile. Being wedged between the board and the heatsink leaves it prone to damage from improper removal of the logic board. There's a maze of 22 flex cables to disconnect before we even proceed to unscrewing the board. Apple has hidden four of the 14 screws under plastic caps. I can't think of a reason for this design other than to make finding the screws harder. Given the vast number of screws, their different heads and sizes, it's important I keep track of them to make reassembly easier. With the board finally free, I can carefully lift it out, watching to not rip any cables in the process. And there it is, a MacBook Pro with Apple's M1 Pro, 16 gigs of RAM and a terabyte of storage. Unfortunately, there's nothing to repair or upgrade here. But with it out, we can see the fingerprint reader and its flimsy cable. This would be so easy to tear if you're not careful. We can also get a look at those replaceable ports. You do have to remove the board in order to access them, but this is by far the most positive thing from a repair point of view so far. Having a peek at that keyboard, I did see a screw. Excited, I dug a little deeper to find dreaded rivets. A common practice in MacBooks since 2012. I've replaced one, and I tell you, never again. I did actually fix this MacBook Pro, although it really doesn't look like I am. Older MacBooks use screws, not just around the perimeter of the keyboard, but for the whole keyboard. What I believe to be a cost-cutting measure makes replacing the keyboard almost impossible, requiring the whole top case to be replaced instead, which is significantly more expensive. So you want to hope you don't spill anything on that keyboard. I'll remove the logic board from our other MacBook Pro so we can swap across to a different board to see what happens to this computer when everything inside of it has suddenly changed. That includes the display, battery, ports, and even the Wi-Fi antenna. Well, we get our glitchy screen back, along with the other issues we had when we replaced the display. But this time I've lost my fingerprints, and it won't let me add any new ones, saying it's unable to complete the Touch ID enrollment. But the sleep function works, so like I mentioned before, the sleep sensor isn't paired to the logic board, but the screen. The screen however is paired to the logic board, which is why we're getting those issues with the display's image and backlight. Though I was surprised to see the battery health working, but probably for not much longer now that I mentioned it. With that, it's time to get these laptops back into original condition, by putting all the right parts back into the correct laptops. Thankfully, I labelled them to make this easier. What isn't easy is trying to get the flex cables out from underneath the board and making sure not to trap anything whilst installing it. If we removed around 60 screws to take out the display and logic board, we now have to put all those back in. And as I have two laptops, that's a total of 240 times I've had to remove or fasten a screw in this video. With the logic board fastened into place, it's time for all those flex cables. This step isn't difficult, just very time consuming.
Now I can go ahead and attach the battery, its data cable and the trackpad flex. Now I just have to repeat that whole process for the other laptop. Once I've got the inside cleaned up, it's time for the bottom panel to go on. It has tabs at the top that must slide under the corresponding sections inside the laptop. Once in place, I can press it down and fasten the remaining screws. With one laptop back together, it's time for the other. Now the moment of truth. Do they still both work? And just like that, they're working like they were before I opened them up. And we're done. So this is it. The Apple Silicon MacBook Pro. I believe third party repair is not viable as without unfettered access to the calibration software, the laptop you purchased can't be fixed by anyone but the manufacturer. This laptop has great performance and loads of potential, but in terms of repair, it comes dead last. In the end, the MacBook Pro is a laptop with a soldered on SSD and RAM, a battery secured with glue, not screws, a keyboard held in with rivets, a display and lid angle sensor no third party can replace without Apple, but it has modular ports, so I guess that's something. But I don't feel it's worthy if I fix its 4 out of 10 repairability score, because if it breaks, you have to face Apple's repair cost. With no repair competition, they can charge whatever they like. You either front the cost or toss the laptop, leaving me wondering who really owns this computer. And on that note, this has been a huge Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, consider subscribing and check out the Teardown and Repair Assessment playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any used devices, be sure to check out my online store, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video, and I'll catch you guys next time.